Good morning. Thank you for worshiping with us here at DeWitt Community Church on March 28th, 2021. Today is Palm Sunday, which marks Jesus' entry into Jerusalem and the beginning of Holy Week. During Holy Week, we recount the last days of Jesus, His Last Supper, and sacrifice on the cross. Today, as we worship, we have some opportunities for ministry and connection to share with you. First, we invite you to our Monday, Thursday service featuring music, reflection, and communion at 7 p.m. on Thursday. Also on Friday, we commemorate Jesus's life and sacrifice on the cross on Good Friday. The sanctuary will be open from noon to one for a silent reflection while music is played. At 7 p.m., we will have our Good Friday service with worship, music, and reflection. And on Easter Sunday, we will have two services at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. in the sanctuary. Please RSVP for each one of these services on our website, dewittchurch.org RSVP. Second, there's a new six-week study starting April 11th on Sundays based on Max Lucado's God's Story, Your Story, When His Becomes Yours which explores your purpose in the world, seeing ourselves in God's greater narrative, and how your daily life relates to God's grand epic story. This will be offered in person, in room six, and on Zoom. If you're interested in this study, please contact the church office. Please consider supporting our ministry and church by giving a gift on our website, give.dewittchurch.org or send a gift to the church office. Your contributions make an impact on our people and community. We cannot serve our community without you. This morning, we are in the sixth week of our message series, Flourishing. Today, as we remember Jesus's triumphant ride into Jerusalem and people waving palm branches, shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. We look deeper into the activity of two unnamed disciples who are tasked with locating a colt for Jesus to ride. The act of untying plays an important role in the story and helps us understand our flourishing and hope and change in our lives.
In scripture, we hear over and over God telling us not to be afraid. Yet how can we live this out when it seems like the world is spinning out of control? Giving our tithes and offerings this morning is one way of testifying that we trust God, that we know that the blessings we receive are given to us by God and that he will sustain us in both times of plenty and times of want. By giving back to God through supporting the ministries here at DeWitt Community Church, each of us makes a declaration of our faith being bigger than our fears. Our gifts show we trust God even in a world that keeps telling us to be afraid. We let go of thinking that we are on our own and live each day in graceful dependence on God. We ask that you prayerfully consider supporting the reach of this ministry through your giving today. Let us gather our gifts together and offer them to God in gratitude and praise. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you for the ministry at this church. We thank you for all the people that support it faithfully with their tithes and offering. We ask that you will help us reach out into the community and touch all those who need your healing touch. Show us that you can support us each and every day and that we can depend on you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If there's any children in your home that you'd like to come in front of the TV today to see the children's sermon, I invite them forward for this morning. Hello, boys and girls. I was moving the furniture around in my living room yesterday to do some cleaning, and look what I found under the couch. It's a tennis ball. It wasn't something I was expecting to find inside my house. Tennis balls are usually used outside. Well, actually, I found two tennis balls that my dogs, Harper and Henry, must have played with and left under the couch by mistake. If I drop one of these tennis balls from up here, the ball will either fall or bounce. If it bounces, how high do you expect it'll bounce? Well, it could bounce this high, or it could bounce this high, or maybe this high. Do you expect it to bounce way up here? Okay, let's find out. One, two, three. Uh-oh, the ball didn't bounce at all. Did you see that? Is that what you expected it to do? No, why not? It could be because the ball didn't bounce because there's a hole inside of it from where my dog was chewing on it. But what I really want to know is how you felt about the bounce not happening even though you expected it to happen. Did you notice how many times I used the word expected a whole lot when I was talking to you? To expect something or have expectations about something means we have thoughts and feelings about how something should happen. But one problem with expectations sometimes is that things don't always happen like we thought they were going to happen, like with the tennis ball not bouncing. When expectations are not met, we might feel upset or cheated or sad or let down. I bring this up because the crowds that surrounded Jesus in today's scripture story that Pastor Allen's going to preach on in a little while expected certain things from Jesus. They expected Jesus to be the next king, which is why they were having a parade for him. 
But guess what? That's not what Jesus was going to do or become. And that did upset some of the people because that's not what they expected. Thankfully, Jesus did not try to do the things that the crowds expected him to do, even though they upset some of them. Instead, Jesus listened to what God was telling him to do, and then Jesus did those things. And because Jesus did what God was telling him to do, then something happened for Jesus that was far better than what the people expected. Instead of becoming a king, Jesus showed us something even better. Jesus showed us that the life God offered us is something that cannot be taken away no matter what happens. When we trust God with our most important things, like Jesus did, then what God provides us is something bigger and greater than we could ever have expected. And that's good news for us today. Will you pray with me as we thank God for Jesus? Gracious God, we thank you today that Jesus did what you asked him to do and not what the people expected of him, that you made a way for us to go to heaven to be with you someday. Help us to always remember that Jesus was the greatest king we had, the king of all kings. And through his life, death, and resurrection, he opened up a way for us to heaven. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, I'm a midwife, boys, no man works like you. Only from Jordan, he did cross. 
this sermon series, I've been sharing with you key insights into the spiritual behaviors that are life-giving. We are not meant to just survive in this life, but to thrive, to flourish. Throughout this message series, we've discovered how daily prayer, discipleship, love, forgiveness, and service are directly connected with our human thriving. Today, we look closely at Jesus' ride into the holy city and the act of the two disciples who are tasked with untying a colt. We read from Mark's Gospel, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphuji and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing? untying that colt. They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is the one in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything. But since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Let us pray. O oh God, open our ears to hear your word. Open our minds so that we can understand. And open up our hearts to receive your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In his best-selling book, Into Thin Air, John Krakauer tells of the hazards that plague some climbers as they attempted to reach the summit of Mount Everest. Andy, one of the expedition leaders, stayed at the peak too long, and on his descent he was in dire need of oxygen. Andy radioed the base camp and told them about his predicament. He mentioned that he had come across a cache of oxygen containers left by other climbers, but they were all empty. The climbers who had already passed the canisters on their own descent knew that they were not empty, but actually full of oxygen. The base camp pleaded with Andy on the radio to make use of the oxygen canisters. Andy was starved. For oxygen. But he continued to argue that the canisters were empty. The problem was that the lack of what he needed, oxygen, had so disoriented his mind that Andy would not listen to life-saving advice. Though he was surrounded by something that would give him life, he continued to complain of its absence after pleas from his team. It's that during this point in the coronavirus, there might be some of us who think that hope is in short supply. Or maybe this pandemic has you thinking that your supply tank of hope is empty. Maybe you're short on hope. You don't think that maybe your marriage will get any better. Or you don't think you'll find that job. Or you don't think that you'll ever get your life back on track. Researchers have found that a key component to human thriving is an ample supply of hope for our lives. Dr. Charles R. Snyder, a psychologist at the University of Kansas, and as a pioneer in the area of hope, wrote about a model of hope that has three components, goals, agency, and pathway. Goals, the thinking that we can achieve something Agency, we have the ability to achieve what we hope for. 
and pathway. The idea that there's an avenue, there's a spot, a road for us to take that goal. For us followers of Jesus, hope is on the horizon. And in the story of the Palms and Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, hope is on the horizon for His followers. The Romans, for hundreds of years, had occupied the land that God's people were in, and they, they were ready for change. And Christ is walking up to the city mount, and it's quite a climb up to Jerusalem because it sits about 3,800 feet above sea level. Jesus had the agency and pathway to widen His followers' capacity for hope and change. And as much as people celebrate with their hosannas, which means save us, and the coats laid out on the road and the, the branches, the palm branches that are waving, perhaps the crowd didn't know what had happened before Jesus had entered into the city of Jerusalem. We may even brush aside the beginning of the story from Mark's gospel. Jesus instructs two unnamed disciples to go into the village ahead to look for a colt. John's gospel states that this animal is a donkey. I've often wondered if these two disciples questioned the seriousness of their mission. I imagine them saying to one another, you know, Jesus is always sending us on go for missions, go for this, go for that. Remember when he sent us to get some fish and bread that one time to feed everyone? Oh yeah, and then there, there was that time when he wanted us to produce a coin with Caesar's face on it. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. And then there was that time at, at a wedding when, when he wanted us to get those heavy jugs of water and then Jesus turned the water into wine. Why is Jesus always doing the exciting work while we're left doing the dirty work? How, can, how come we can't be like Peter and get to do cool stuff like walk on water? Jesus wanted to let his disciples know that he was not sending them on a gopher mission, the equivalent of a modern-day Starbucks run, because little did these two disciples know that their task was critical to what we celebrate today as the Palm Sunday event. They are to retrieve a colt, which is perhaps the most overlooked character in the story. The colt is an instrument of a message. This cult was born for Jesus' wonderful work. It had not been used or ridden by anyone else. And this cult was tied up so that it wouldn't wander away or be taken away. It was waiting there for Jesus to climb on and to ride. The cult has royal associations. Jesus Riding on a donkey or a colt echoes the regal arrival of Zechariah's prophecy, which reads, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fold of a donkey, from Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Nevertheless, to modern readers, the colt or the donkey seems to be an unlikely and surprising device for Jesus to use. We see colts or donkeys primarily as work animals capable of carrying heavy loads or docile creatures used for children's rides, but certainly not as the animals of choice to transport triumphant kings. For as much as we often focus on the entry of Jesus on Palm Sunday, there is more significance to the colt in this story. Earlier I know the animal was tied up and had to be untied by the disciples. In Mark's gospel, the word tied or tied or untie is used three times. And Luke, his rendering of this passage uses five verses to mention this animal being tied and untied. The detail is important. This cult was created for a purpose, and it was meant for Jesus. It was tied and needed to be untied. 
Why do the gospel writers emphasize this tied and untied several times? I think it's because we're often tied, aren't we? We're tied down by many things, guilt, anxiety, hopelessness, concern. Some of us are tied down, but we need to forgive. But we can't bring ourselves to forgiveness. Others are tied down to obsessions or chemical dependence. We may be tied down by our smartphones or our tablets, unable to put those devices down. Maybe we're tied to fear and are afraid to show love, peace, faith, joy, or the gospel to other people. As a pastor, I witness every day the real-life troubles that bind people to dysfunction, challenges, fear, and they're too scared to untie themselves from these chains of fear. Hope seems to be on short supply when we allow our mistakes, fears, and failures to tie us from ever seeing or experiencing hope and change in our lives. I once saw a TV interview and the reporter was interviewing a man who proclaimed himself to be the unluckiest man in the world. And the man humorously claimed that he had such a pattern of failures and mistakes and bad outcomes in his life that he didn't see much hope. And he said with a smile this, some people argue that they see life as glass half empty or glass half full. In my life, I never got a glass. It's easy to have a bleak outlook on life if we always evaluate our past as our certain future. God, however, came on a cult to change all that. We may make the mistake of thinking that optimism and hope are the same thing, but they're not. Christian theologian Jürgen Moltmann once distinguished between optimism and hope. Moltmann said that optimism has to do with positive outcomes in the future emerging from the past and present. We forecast what is possible in the future. If it looks good, we're optimistic. According to Moltmann, hope, however, concerns itself with fruitful possibilities in the future that come outside of our actions or others, but instead come by God's hand, which is the gift of something new. In order to flourish in life, to celebrate the triumphant entry of God into our lives, we must untie ourselves from the thinking that things will not change based on past results. God is bigger and more powerful than our past. Palm Sunday is not just a celebration of Jesus as Lord, but a celebration of Jesus as our liberator from our afflictions. We need to be freed to experience Jesus in our lives. We are meant to ride with Jesus, to follow him on his journey to Jerusalem, the holy city. Palm Sunday is an occasion where we can ask ourselves, what is it that needs to be untied in my life so that I can praise and honor God? We can often be our own toughest critic when it comes to evaluating our lives. Sometimes the hardest person to forgive is ourselves. Someone once told me that there's this famous weaving studio in Denmark and some of the world's finest tapestries and churches and in buildings are created there. And these tapestries are, are massive and they're woven vertically by several weavers at once working from behind the tapestry. Now they can't see the front, but their work is 
directed by an artist out front who can stand and see everything and gives instructions. A tourist once asked what happens when one of the workers makes a mistake in the tapestry. And the guide simply explained this, the weaver is a master. He weaves mistakes into the design. If we ever want to experience hope and change in our lives, we must see God as our divine weaver who redeems all the mistakes, all the errors, all the sins in our life, and creates a new and wonderful picture of what life can be. Hope comes from God's ability to change our hearts, our minds, and our souls. God can untie us from our past so that we can be released into a new future. When we are untied from our past failures and mistakes, we accept that we are created with a purpose to live a flourishing life with God and with one another. Hope and change are essential elements to our human flourishing and thriving. When we are untied from our failures and fear, we can live a life of faith free from the pressure of trying to hold everything up in life. On Palm Sunday, we cannot fully commit to God when we are tied back by our past. So we must surrender our burdens and our weights to God, much like the owner who surrendered this cult to the two disciples. By untying our burdens, we can praise and worship God and flourish freely. On Palm Sunday, we can praise God just like those who praise Jesus with branches, palms, and coats, colts, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory to God in the highest. Palm Sunday is the day when we, like Jesus' animal companion, are untied and free and set loose to be used for the work of God. May you be untied for hope and change to share in Jesus' entry into our lives so that we may unite with the one who was tied on a cross to be our Savior. Let us pray. God, it comes to our attention on such a celebration of Palm Sunday. We remember Jesus' entry, the people and the crowds excited with the hope and possibility of the change of what it might mean for them in their lives. God, help us to see that this act of untying is an important element in, in this story. That God, hidden through the shouts and the hosannas, is this act of tying and untying, this act of release, of letting go. God, we request, ask, petition for hope and change in our lives. God, help us to see that if we are to flourish and thrive, that God, we need to access hope and change in our own lives. Help us to see on this Palm Sunday the things that need to be let go so that we may flourish and celebrate you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Depart now in the fellowship of God the Father, and as you go, remember, in the goodness of God you are born into this world. By the grace of God you've been kept all the day long, even until this very hour, by the love of God fully revealed in the face of Jesus Christ, you and I are being redeemed. 